Hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to The Good, The Bad and The Rugby. It's good to have you back with us once again this week. We are in partnership with our good friend City Index, who are the global provider of spread betting, CFD and Forex trading. That's the first test done and dusted. My God, there's a lot to talk about, which we will get into in a moment or two. Uh, we do just want to start by saying a big thank you to City Index for their support and their partnership with us during this Lions Tour of South Africa. Uh, we have just wrapped up the first of many competitions, so do keep a lookout across our social channels for your chance to win merch, tickets and experiences. This week, uh, I'm back alongside the Hoff, who I have to say did an outstanding job of steering this good ship last week in my absence. Very nice to have you here. Tins is on holiday. Um, quite rightly so. He's had a busy week or so, so probably needs two or three weeks to recover from that. Don't fear, though. We've got one of the game's golden boys coming in this week um, to dissect the game, to talk about a remarkable career as well. He's a back row who was a bit of a hero to our wee hask. He captained the box and the barbars in his time. He won the Rugby World Cup. He was the poster boy of South African rugby during the glory years. And he's joining us here in the studio on the good, the bad and the rugby in partnership with City Index, as we said. It's a very warm welcome to Mr. Bob Skinstad. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you very much for having me, guys. It's good to be here. Thank you for coming. This is actually your old stomping ground. Well, it is. And I've actually, I've come bearing gifts. Excellent. I love that. Anyone who brings us presents is immediately in our top two. Hask is always, is always talking about, so this is pure protein. Amazing. Oh, excellent. At the, excellent. At the station on the way here. That's oh, unbelievable. It's Bob's beef. This and is that's lovely. He's oh, brought Bill Tong just, just, just beef. feast. That is unbelievable. It's the true <laughs> South African. You, 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 I mean, I don't, you, uh, home is here now, isn't it? But the, yeah, yeah. the no, South we, African boy is still very much alive oh, and well. Don't worry about that. They, and you know what it's calm. like. Most of the stations around London, there's, there's, there's a corner with a few saffirs hanging around and some Biltong smells coming out of it. I can find one with a, with a, you know with a cane, going. exactly. Well, right. two things. Most people normally bring us lawsuits and you brought us <laughs> gifts. So we'll take that. And the second is, we'll, surprise, surprise, there's a load of South African shops in Fulham where I think most of the employees of the old slug and lettuce and the Weatherspoons were all South Africans. Hello, my friend. Do you know the snake bite? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes, please, I yes, do. Yes, I will, thank you. How are you? you look extremely well. The first thing you said, actually, yeah. when Bob walked in, is, God, you look lean. You look well and tanned. Yeah. What's keeping you busy now? Um, still, you know, business-wise, um, I've, I've been doing the same sort of thing for five and a half, six years over here. Yeah. Um, but... Modeling? Is that modeling? <laughs> <laughs> but I, to be honest, you know, lockdown was was a bit of a, a recheck and, and, you know, you're not out entertaining clients, doing all that kind of thing. What do you do? So... I've tried to stay fit with my kids. I still play a bit of footy, um, five-a-side and eight-a-side football. Yeah. And, are you banging um, the goals or are you just patrolling at the back? I, I start at the back and I sort of edge up from about minute one to six <laughs> and then I stay at the front. Moaning, lean on the goals. Exactly, lean on the goals, yeah. yeah. But no skill whatsoever. But I'll run all night, so I, I do enjoy that. How was the body, though? How was the body with the frame? I'm okay. I'm okay. I've still got a few um, sort of creaky things from rugby. Um, I would say... You know, golf and that kind of thing. Shoulder and neck are a bit sore, but running. I'm a, as long as I'm either walking or sprinting, I'm okay. Jogging. If I do, if I do a three k jog, I'll have a swollen knee. From that wasn't rugby. That was a car accident. We we can get into that yeah, later. Yeah, we can talk but, about that. But I've got a wobbly knee, <laughs> and um, literally three k jog on that, it'll swell up like you won't believe. But if you do ten wind sprints, nothing because it's you know they're different muscles. So. Everything else is okay, I think. Nice. You were talking about just the mind that's gone. <laughs> yeah, we're all on that boat. What you were saying that you nearly had your foot taken off. You were comparing <laughs> war stories. Yeah, okay. So I was at um, I was Twickenham a few weeks ago doing the O2 stuff, and there's a guy called Tweety David Sylvester who works for England. He's a uh, former Royal Marine. He's worked with England as a fitness a trainer. Brilliant guy, legend of a bloke. And I was talking to him, and I could and I said to him about my ankle. I've got arthritis. I can't run anymore. I haven't run in two years or three years now really struggle with it, limp around the place. And he went, oh, he looked at me, paused, and he went, oh, we had a, had a guy, like that, guy like that in the Marines. He goes, what have they told you to do? And I said, well, they said that you'd probably fuse it. And I, and I said, well, you know, it's, if you fuse it, 36, not great. Mm. And he went, well, I tell you what, we, we, our mate did. He chopped it off. And I was like, shut up, tweet. I'm not going to chop, chop it off. He went, yeah, what he did is he, he chopped it off and put a prosthetic on. Right, and they went um, seriously, and I was like, "Reedy, I'm not cutting <laughs> my fucking foot off." And he went, "Yeah, but he cut it off. He's got a prosthetic. He's still in the Marines. He's still running, and he's still serving." Right, and you could see him. And for, you know, a split second, I thought, 
hmm, maybe <laughs> shall I get like a a like a metal foot or like a bla- like a bla- there's bla- definitely a sponsorship opportunity. There is potential, there but then and then they all started seeing because it was it was during the English stuff. It's coming off. <laughs> it's coming off. Has ankles coming off? And I, I was like, lads, I'm not chopping my foot off. And I actually went back to my wife and thought and said, listen. What do you think? She just walked out and said, you're an idiot. You're idiots. Don't ever chop your foot off. So I would love if that was a gag. That would have been a very funny gag. But my son came back with a process. I went, lads, I've done it. And they went, oh, no, we were joking. We, we, we were joking. joking. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. But imagine that. But he said he, they said he lopped it off and he's still serving. But I don't know as whether that's better or worse. 2021. He'll be doing hill sprints in no time. Imagine that. But, uh, look, the quality of, of surgery has, has changed a lot. Yeah. You know, it's not like... It's, you're not like a pirate with, yeah. a, with a wooden. <laughs> I want I mean, one. You would have a prosthetic. You, you, you just want a patch and, yeah, a, and a wooden. I would have a, honestly with a few if, notches. Mate, for your I've got to say, if they said to me, if they said, "Listen, Miss Haskell, we've got this, this titanium polymer alloy <laughs> or a fucking wooden stick," I'd be like, "Put the put the peg on the end of it. Put a peg on the end of it." Because the jokes. Imagine me walking into the. That's how are you, Long John Hask? I love that. <laughs> Um, you two, you, I don't know if you'd remember this, but you two actually played against each other, didn't you? You were saying that your, your body no, 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 no. Oh, he wasn't playing. No, no, you no. Complimented no. him on your combo. Yeah, do you remember? I mean, you might remember this. I was playing for the Highlanders against the Cheetahs, mm. and you were commentating. Oh, you were Africa commentating. And some guy grabbed me by the nuts, and I threw a punch. Mm. Right, and I remember coming off, and you were like, "Ask a nice combination." You'd obviously been doing the TV stuff, and I was like. What do you mean, Bob? I didn't. I didn't throw. And he went. Yeah, you did. I went. No, I did. I just threw one punch. He went. No, my friend. You actually went. No, my friend. You threw three punches. <laughs> and I was like, really? And then I watched it back. And I, I pulled and I threw a left, a right, and then I and I hooked him. And I got five week ban for that. I just lost my head. I don't think you. I don't. It didn't look like you were you were looking for him. I think no. it was a reaction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thing, definitely. Yeah, yeah. But, but it was I, just I, funny. I said nice combo. Yeah, that's because, what I mean. Because he looked like he knew what you were doing. I know. And he, you know, I know. Boom, 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 and it, you know, everybody was. But anyway, I but, was partly like really excited that. Bobby Skins had, had uh, A was talking to me, spoken to, yeah. spoken to me, B, and then B that he actually noticed what I was doing, and, and then C the sort of fear of like, oh crap, what have I done? I'm uh, because that's when we came back, was it? We were 33 points down, we ended up yeah. winning 36 33. You guys had a cracking game. I, I love the, the, I mean, I'm a big fan of, of Hask and the way he played rugby as well, but, but I love the fact that he chucked it in and went to New Zealand. I, yeah. I tried to do a similar thing as a youngster, I went, you know, and, and, not much of it happens these days. You 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 can't remember Jono did it going to New Zealand, ended up playing for New Zealand on a twenty one. That those kind of stories for me. Go somewhere else, do it. What's the new challenge? It's, you can't always do it because sometimes you're on a path and you fall off that path and yeah. you're in the wilderness. But this one for me, because super rugby, well, it's become not so super at the, at the moment. But but for a while, you know, super ten, super twelve, it was outstanding. It was yeah. the best watch. We, we did games. We did many many mornings. You know, and afternoon. it was just outstanding to watch. You know, I don't know what war, how they've managed it, but they've managed to suck all the life out of it. Yeah. But you went at a stage just before it became too big. Yeah. And the Highlanders were a cracking side. Yeah. They've got an amazing fan base. You know, and at that stage of your life, why not? I know. You know and I loved it to be. It was amazing. You're, you're so right, actually, because I. We were saying before you came on, um, you know, that kind of era, your era coming to sort of, the, you know, uh, the late kind of 2000s, I think was definitely the best rugby. I grew up watching, you know, the Blues, um, mm. uh, you know, oh, all those high canes, canes yeah, in South Africa, you know, in, in the South sharks. Africans, the Sharks, Bulls. everything. All of it was just so good on TV. You know, great kits, yeah, yeah. great moments. I thought, you know, remember the Tri Nations, how good oh, that was. Fantastic. Um, and it, I was, just, it was less is more. There wasn't, yeah. it wasn't like, 300,000 games crammed into X. Yeah. It was like you, you played, it was Super 12. So you're either home or away yeah. against one of those teams. That yeah. was it. Yeah. You're 100% right. And actually, even up here in the UK, you only got one or two games a weekend. And therefore, if you missed mm. it, that was your lot. Mm. And so everybody used to get up to watch it. It was a mm. really intense, exciting competition to be a part of full houses as well. Mm-hmm. We seen oh, those big well. time. Um, there is so much to talk to you about. And obviously, we'd love, we, we will get into not only the game itself, but also Rassi's been busy on Twitter this week. As well, I don't know if you've seen any of that. But given that we're talking I've heard, about, I haven't yeah, seen yeah, it yet. We'll, but... we'll definitely we won't get into trouble, but it'd be fascinating to kind of pick up on that. But given that we're talking about almost the heyday of Super Rugby and the heyday of the Tri Nations, we'd love to start with you. And there was there was a time where you were front page of everything in South Africa. You were one of the golden boys of the sport itself. Does that feel like yesterday? Does it feel like a lifetime ago? Was it? different era how do you no. equate where you are now with what you had at one stage which was the world in your hands 
No, I, I mean, I think it, 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 it feels like a lifetime ago, but not too disconnected. I mean, it's a, it was a great time. I was incredibly lucky. We, you know, there were, a, I came through an era of some incredibly talented rugby players around me. I mean, I was, yeah. I was famously, you know, avoiding any form of contact for most of my career. But <laughs> Amazing but, you both but, played the same position because one definitely got caught at the bottom of a few more rocks than the you other. Know, but I always used to, I would have gravitated to Hask and said, listen, you know that tackling <laughs> and all that shit that you love doing? Once you've won the ball, flick it, flick it to your mate. <laughs> I, I was watching his highlight <laughs> reel. Step try, yeah. I was watching his highlight, highlight reel before and I was like, there's all this stuff and I was like, I can't see, where is Bobby here? And then on the end, gets it, cuts in side steps or my favourite one which I actually think uh, when I watched it, I tried to reenact and no doubt probably dropped the ball, is the bit where you got it, you ran across, showed the ball behind your back, uh, the Australian fly half bought it and you run it under the post. That was absolute champagne. <laughs> I didn't have any of that in my arsenal. But then I, did, I don't remember that there's any tackles in any of the highlights. No, no, no don't, worry one. don't worry about no, that. Don't worry about that. Use the no, touchline as no, a No, exactly, exactly. But was it, was this, because not only were you at the height of your powers at the point when the game in that part of the world was at its best, but also you'd come through in a really sort of highly, tip, hotly tipped. There was a lot about you at a young age as well. Mm. Was it always, were you born to do it type thing? No, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question because there was a whole bunch of events which happened, you know. So, so the, the genesis was that, that rugby was, when I started playing rugby, rugby was amateur. So I got a scholarship to Stellenbosch University, which at the time was the biggest rugby club in the world. I think it's still close to the biggest rugby club in the world. I think they had 50 or 60 operating teams. I mean, I was there and it was competitive and we were playing good rugby, but it was amateur. And then it was 1995 World Cup and everybody started campaigning for, I mean, there were full stadiums, guys were making money out of this game and, and rugby became professional. And that year, I was the captain of South Africa under 19 after being the captain of Stellenbosch under 19. So technically what happened was I was the first contracted professional rugby player in the whole of South Africa because they went right. out and said, well, we better get the youngest team, sign them up, and there's the skipper, will you sign here? I was like, they said, can we pay you money to do what you're already doing and enjoying? I was like, yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I was the worst negotiator that. in the world. I was and, like, yes, where do I sign? You know? But you ha I mean, you were negotiating it yourself. I mean, did no. they say this is what it is? Or did you say, I think this is where I want to go park No, it? no, they, they, this is what it is. Okay. Yesterday, we didn't pay you. Tomorrow, if you sign this, we will. Yes, you will. And we will. And we will. Let's go for it. So it was, it was heady. It was like, suddenly, it yeah. was something you did for a living. And then there was two or three years while we, that found its feet because rugby then became sort of a, a vocation, you know, and, and people then could say, okay, well, actually, now if you go to Western Province, you can get a small contract. If you make the national team, you can get a slightly bigger contract and there was something to work towards. But it happened pretty quickly. If you yeah. talk to the guys in um, the premiership, for example, when that, when that went professional, they sort of said that most people didn't understand what the level of financial remuneration was. They didn't kind of understand um, how much to pay. And for some people, I think like Lawrence, I think when they signed up Lawrence, I think they just started like writing zeros. What, zeros. Yeah, you could have whatever you wanted. Yeah. Was that like in South Africa? Did they kind of get a balance? Because what, what apparently happened is they went mad, mm. realized that um, they'd probably overextended and then eventually it all settled back down. I wonder, was that the same in South Africa for that kind of stuff? So, so the, the, I mean, <clears throat> the, the nub of the problem here in South Africa, and, and this is, I mean, I've, I've actually come out a few times and said this. So, so sp Sport, the players became professional, but the administrators never did. So what happened was you had all of the volunteers and part-timers, yeah. you know, school coach becomes varsity coach, becomes Western Province assistant coach, and then starts getting, you know, his stuff covered on the side and he's there. Now he's negotiating a contract, doesn't even have a high school diploma. He's negotiating a contract with Joost van der Westhuizen. You're going to have some mistakes, yeah. you know, and that's where a lot of stuff slipped through the cracks. So, so absolutely, that that World Cup side went from earning nothing to hundreds of thousands, admittedly rands, but hundreds of thousands of rands per month. Do you remember what that must have been like? I mean, you were you were front page of glossy magazines. You were watch deals, car deals, the works. Was it was it was it comfortable? Was it just no, like it this? No, it was uncomfortable. I mean, it was you know we we weren't ready for it. You know, we were we were a young bunch of players who loved the game, knew each other, and had played together. Rob Fleck, Brayton Pulser, Percy Montgomery. I mean, Monty was was the biggest thing since sliced bread as well. You know, and and we all played for for the same team, got on well, we were mates, 
and and we were producing on the field. We were winning the domestic competitions, and and so you know it did ramp up. But remember, those were media deals driven by the excitement around the professionalism. Suddenly, suddenly these guys were like, well, we need we need to sell tickets to the matches. We need to sell broadcast deals as well. So just pump it. So we were in every publication. I mean, I look back now, it is cringe city, you know, loose, you fit, have, yeah. loose fitting Levi jeans with no shirt on next to the pool. Let's have a, I know, love let, that let's though. have a ticket sales uh, up by 90%. <laughs> I love it. Let, uh, let, nah, nah, let's do an interview dressed like that. Are you joking? <laughs> I love that. That's like my entire back catalogue of interviews. I'm very rarely wearing any clothes. I'm like ill fitting denim jeans. Uh, have you got a number for someone I can have? But I, I, I mean, obviously I remember that, that period of time you know, as uh, sort of looking back on it as kind of that South Africa stuff was very sexy, wasn't it? It was mm. that kind of stuff. Mm. You kind of, you said Percy Montgomery. I remember, you know, again, watching it at school, that whole team just had that yeah. sort of real thing about it. And you were kind of a bit like an early NFL team. I, I, um, I read a book by uh, called Boys Will Be Boys um, about the... Um, the Dallas Cowboys mm. when they won sort of four Super Bowls mm. and they and obviously because the, the money was extraordinary they were kind of insane the yeah. stuff they did you know was it did you feel like playboys in South Africa did, was it that kind of excitement because obviously over here we've always played second fiddle to football we've yeah. never had that mm. kind of, and actually quite luckily I think I probably wouldn't mm. be sitting here if we had the same media attention as, as um, me football players but I just wondered in South Africa where the, everybody loves rugby mm. whether you were was it did you realise how, how high you actually got so I mean, it's a great question. So, for context, it was never, it was never out of control, Fine. but it was it was wilder than it should have been, yeah. you know. And and I, th I say I, I say wilder than it should have been. I mean, there are a few different things. I mean, if you if you catalogue that, then there's like okay, fame creates the hype. So so what are you doing? You're going out. You you are, are you are you using drugs? Are you going hectic on alcohol? Beer, beer and, and rugby in South Africa, it's it's more of a drinking culture yes, yes, than, yeah. than a hectic drugs culture. Yeah, so, yeah. so there was very little of that. It was a bit of usage by some of the players, but certainly not by by the guys that I knew yeah. close to me, as in wild in, in, in nightclubs right, and that right. kind of thing. But some of the guys started, you know, it became, I mean, we... <laughs> We had, so here's, here's context, a little old South Africa. We're just a little sort of farmer's town and thing, like a really wild weekend. So I, I got a sponsorship from Guinness. Oh, yeah. As the, the South African representative pre the 99 World Cup. Okay, so they installed a tap in my house. <laughs> so then we would have, after the matches, we would have the other team you know, we'd have a few drinks in the change room and I lived about a mile from Newland Stadium and they would come to my house. Oh, amazing. I wish. And, but then we'd, we'd close the street and then they would just come in. And I mean, we had a guy who shat on my roof. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what I mean. I just, thank <laughs> God there weren't camera phones. No, no, God, also, no, it was crazy. I sort of wish but some we still had been talk. documented, how no, good the stories would be. So we'd still talk. And, and so, so Timmy Horan was a great hero of mine growing yeah. up. I mean, he, you know, 91 World Cup, they'd, they'd, they'd come onto the scene, him and Jason and... Um, little and, and suddenly they were playing for the Queensland Reds and we'd come into the mix and we were playing quite well. We'd knocked them over the year before. We they play. So I said to one of the guys that I'd met at a sevens tournament, I was like, tell your guys, come to our house. We're having a, a digs party. So the whole Queens Ra Queensland Reds team turned up at my house. We had a little four bedroom. I mean, a tiny, but literally there must have been about 900 people waiting to try and get in. And we, we had a guy on the gate and we just had, but we had our team. So yeah. Monty and Timmy Horan are chugging Guinnesses at the bar. It, like it wasn't more hectic no, than no, that. No. It was hectic, but it wasn't more it was hectic than that. Box office, box office, stardust type. Well, if you think about it, I mean, that's that's pretty sort of grungy and normal. No, like but we, I love we it We could though. have all been in a, in a nightclub yeah. in town, you know, going bananas. But we were, <laughs> you know, Warwick Wall was going, hey, look at this, and sticking his thumb through the beer and chugging a beer because he's the world's biggest human. And everyone's going, go, go, go. Elton Flackley doing... Um, Back somersaults off the roof into the pool, no, and that's about as bad as. No, it but, got, that, but so. how exciting! Because yeah. obviously, remember, we're talking in like rugby relevant rugby terms. Yeah. If, you know, if it was an NFL party, yeah. potentially, oh, but no, 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 no. of cocaine, you'd, 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 you wouldn't Gu have a four bedroom. Guns, bed in, the guns car. in the yeah, you'd have everything, <laughs> right? Which you know, it, when rugby becomes more professional, hopefully those things will, <laughs> well, those things will happen, and I'll make a return if they do. Um, I wonder <laughs> with your one foot, <laughs> with my one foot, the player you once were. Was there was there ever any moment? Um, you know, where you sort of turn, you know, like I was watching the Grand Prix the other day and Lewis Hamilton won at Silverstone and in the pit lane was Tom Cruise. 
right, seeing Lewis Hamilton. And, yeah. you know, like celebs meet celebs. I wondered in South Africa, because you've got, you know, you've got lots of, sort of famous people that come mm. from South Africa. Did you ever turn up to one of these events or did someone ever turn up to your house like, Bobby, can we come for a beer? And you're like, who the hell? And then suddenly dawned on you that they were super famous. Did you ever have a moment like that? We, uh, exactly. So, so, so the rugby and then the cricket started getting closer and all of the stars like the, the cricketers as well. And it suddenly became... You know, you're invited to everywhere. You know, so you meet Charlie's Tehran. <gasps> but, she's my uh, absolute no, she's, favorite. She's just unbelievable. No, she's my she? absolute favorite. Though. No, just relax. She's no, my no, favorite. No, no, no. <laughs> well, no, well, no, she's uh, and she's South African. I know, so. I know. <laughs> she's so beautiful. I just want to let you know. She's so beautiful and amazing, and she swears in Afrikaans. And oh, she's so I love cool. my wife, but also she know, that Charlie's Tehran's on my list, and Chloe Is knows. She has exception. Yeah, she's no exception. She's on the list. Oh, you're so, allowed? Yeah, yeah, so if you probably know her, so if you could put a go, because you're the closest I'll ever get to her, I'll, I just want to say, I'll, Charlie. I'll SMS John Smith and get her number for you. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> just Charlie's for listening. I love you. You're an amazing actress. I love your new action movies and you're beautiful and I'll look up. <laughs> amazing. Um, tell me about the rugby itself, because there was, I mean, certainly there were, there were periods of your career when you were untouchable and unplayable, and that comes with an extraordinary sort of profile and, and pressure. Did, did you always wear that very common? Tell, tell me about almost the, the, the best rugby of your career. Did you just feel at times you were playing a different game to other people? I think, um, look, I was, I was very lucky. You know, the, 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 the role of a loose forward was evolving around the world. You know, we, we had in France, and this is probably why I, I mentioned what I did about uh, James and playing overseas, but in France, there were pockets of teams who used to send um, scouts out to South Africa and take players over and they would go and play um, basically sometimes probably two level rugby for, 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 for teams. And they knew there was a good quality of, of player and they sent them over. But because of that, a lot of French players had respect for the South African. So we had Fabien Gaultier playing the off season for his French club in South Africa. We had Lauren Caban, who was a, a, brilliant, a, a loose forward. I mean, I, I, I literally <clears throat> modeled the way I played on what he did, the try from the end of the world that, that you know, they, they scored famously against New Zealand to knock them over in the series, I think in 92. But um, he played for Western Province. Uh, a couple of guys went to the Sharks, um, who were just Natal at that stage. And, and so we had these, these influences um, from outside and and I, I didn't really want to be in the same mold as everybody else um i'd played wing and outside center a few games at, at um, school and then sort of moved and, and become a loose forward and and i had a very progressive uh, coach i was playing sevens at the same time i've got picked for sa sevens before i got picked for for sa um for any of the national sides and um i i, I did feel at the time that what we were doing was different we were, we were de definitely doing, I mean, I was, I was the principal attack um, distributor in second phase for 85% of our moves. We, I, but I had Bromf and Stratton at Flyhoff. <laughs> so 108 kilos of just pure love. He's yeah. just going to truck it up the middle of the channel. Yeah. We had two loose forwards who would just smash anything there. And then what I had was more space, momentum, and the ball. So I played... 10 on the roller run and my inside center was Robbie Fleck and my, you know, outside him was Brayton Pulser. So if you look at any of the tries in that we scored, we created space by playing a bit differently. So at that stage, I felt with a team around us that, that, you know, rugby was, was a game that was just a joy to play for us because yeah. nobody else was playing like that. Yeah. Um, so I didn't feel we would beat anyone into submission. And I often felt now looking back, I've often felt looking back, we, we actually probably with a bit of focus could have done more with less. We, we, we lost in, in um, 1999, we beat um, the Crusaders at home. I, I had a car accident after that. And I, I'm happy to tell you the story about it, but we beat the Crusaders, I think 45, 12 or something at, at, at Newlands. Not many do that. And, you know, we sort of stood back after that and said, okay, well, whatever we're doing, it's, it's going right. We, we need to, but, we had a few fracturings off the field. The the, the Stormers um, at that stage were, were sort of owned and run by the players because it was a, I mean, you would have loved it, but literally it was like if Bath or another club was was the old style and then that you played in a new trans-European competition and that team just went and ran it on their own without anyone else telling them what to do. So we had that freedom for two years. And we had some smart players, some really smart players um, coaches, 
some smart management. Gary Gold was our commercial manager. <laughs> wow. You know, and Gary's, I mean, famously coached around the world yeah, and, yeah. and done a different, a few different things in different guises, but he was a smart guy who'd played rugby and he was like, I want to be associated with that. And he worked for us as a, as a commercial manager. I mean, created havoc for everyone else because he was getting deals and, and working this team into places that, that a rugby team had never been in South Africa. I'm really interested to know what what a young Bobby Skinsack would have been like in a in a South African side. You know, we talk we have a lot. We've had some amazing players come on here talking about kind of your first days within a South African squad. Were you welcomed? Did people talk to you? Were you ignored? You know, were you sort of any any mad initiations? Yeah, we. I mean, we had a, a quite a what's the protocol? You say so you 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 told that. We, we they gave us uh, Fanta and Coca Cola and we watched movies. It was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had. I mean, that's what you're supposed to say. No, I mean, we had quite a. Uh, I mean, we had a hundred year old initiation process to make it into the team. So they 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 fucked us up properly. Really? Yeah, yeah. We had. Um, the, and this is not the national side. Peter Rousseau, who who was an incredible, incredible um, rugby player, um, the most awkward looking person, but just as a but finisher. But a David Schwimmer about him. Yeah, Ross yeah, from yeah, 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 very much so. Yeah, he was, you know, and sort of bow legged and, yeah. and loopy. I mean, he looked like, um, what's that guy, Ikeprod Crane in the head of his horseman. Yeah, 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 yeah. Never really knew if he was a, if he was a wing or a lock or a little, yeah. but he was just an amazing player. Um, he, he in, the, in his Western Province debut, they used to have this thing they would, they'd pour beer on, 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 you had to wear your, your trunks, uh, your, your playing trunks. And they would pour beer in your trunk so that it would stick to your to your bum, and then they would hit you on your bum, and they would go around. Someone would put you on your shoulder and go around and hit you on the on the bum, or whatever. And he had a, a hematoma so so bad he couldn't play for three weeks. Right. So they had some guys who who got it wrong. They they got really excited about the initiate. It's supposed to be sort of a welcome to the club. Not welcome a, to the club. You yeah. know, high five, whack, you're in, or sing a song, do yeah, that. You yeah. know, but but our guys were sort of no, we're going to humiliate you for so long. Actually, it's a little bit like how badly they fucked up that camp, camp stall drought. Yes. So, so I've seen you this, ever involved in I, that? I, I broke my arm on the Wednesday night match before stall drought. Okay, but I'd been part of the planning, which had a senior, you know, Corne Kricher, um, Rudolf Strali, and myself, and uh, who was a Yus and a couple of. I'd, I'd approved what we were doing. Okay, but but none of that was 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 told. Just, to us. just for we, those who don't know, you, you the, the the Bok team went out into the bush. Is that yeah. right? So stall draught in Afrikaans is barbed wire. So it was camp barbed wire. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. St- Gary Steel Gold. Wire. Gary yeah. Gold wasn't running the marketing no. on that one. No, yeah. No, yeah right, exactly. Okay. No. No. And and basically what happened was they they like a lot of teams have is they employed a couple of guys from the military to do a you know break them down and then build them up. To, they yeah. go out to a few sort of um, military type drills, you know, fire a few guns, do all those kind of things under supervision, and then do a few things where you've, you know, you've got to take your pack and go five miles this way and then find this in little teams and, you know, a bit like team, team bonding, t- team bonding, team building. But Rudolf Strali was um, active in the police, I think. And I, I you know, I, I don't quote me on this in terms of the actual thing, but he had friends who'd gone from their police division into what is effectively the highest echelons of active SAS. So in South Africa, like yeah. like branded mercenaries. Yeah, right, I mean, right. they, they were guys, you, you called them in when you need to get a chopper out of... Because there's a lot of, because I read a lot of books, we were talking about them off air, a lot of no. mercenaries in South Africa, a no, lot of mercenaries no. come I mean, Africa. from, there, there was the influence of the Salu Scouts all the way down from Zimbabwe. I mean, my, my family were heavily involved in warfare from early days. This is, these guys were... And still are experts around the world. They get they yes. get they get pulled in. You know when yeah. you when you've when you've got a twenty five million dollar piece of equipment in Mogadishu, they're the kind of guys you yeah, find yeah, to. Yeah. You know, anyway, they're the ones who chop their ankles. On. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, <clears throat> so they had been given the planning for what was going to then happen. So I think first half of this went very very well. Yeah. Second half was a complete shit show. And, and I can't say first-hand accounts. I can only say what had happened. But, it, it, uh, the, but the, the reports, everyone was naked, fighting. No, exactly. So, so put it this way. James and I go with you and three or four other guys, and they say, okay, guys, listen, put a pack on. You carrying food, you carrying munitions, you're going to get five miles away, build a tent. 
make a fire. You've got to cook this, then come back tomorrow. We, we're going to be tired and it's going to be a bit chilly, but we'll probably know and laugh and be a bit more bonded the next day. But what they did was that and then get there, rip the tent away, put you in a pit, take your clothes off, firing guns. Um, everybody gets a rugby ball, get into the dam, deflate the rugby ball, get it to the bottom, get a bowl of mud, come drink the mud. Right. In front of it, so humiliation to the probably to the degree that they might actually go to in the military, but it just wasn't right for the. So, so a few guys snapped, uh, and probably yeah. probably no, lost a few it. guys snapped. So, so we had, um, and the story's only come out now, but we, um, Don, uh, Donny Fun and Hefer's got a got an ice brand. He makes he makes uh, you know pre lovely big sort of. Um, blocks of ice called Stahldraht ice <laughs> because in the middle of winter in the bush there, it's, you know, it's minus three to minus seven degrees. They're in their underpants and sun's gone down. Good luck. See you later. Right. You know, all the vans drive away and it's not like, okay, it's a little bit hard, but then you can sleep here and you, and you survive. It's like you're a prisoner of war. So, so they got it so wrong. And, and then what happened was, a couple of the guys got excited and had a few drinks and they thought, well, let's go and see what's happening to these guys. And they went back and they obviously, you know, then they took photos of the spring box, like, oh, look how these guys have been humiliated. And those photos leaked. So that became the, the Sunday times of the following week. Wow. Uh, special. So it was an absolute PR can disaster. I just, can I just tell you something? Jeez. I love, because when I've been at clubs before and different things, I'm a bit like you, like I want to go hard, have, have some fun. But when it gets like silly, I mean, the same thing with the team social mm. initiations. Mm. You're like, God, what? no, we're not going to do that. Mm. Just have a couple of beers. Mm. You don't have to burn the house down. Mm. Nobody has to. I, 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 I see a very kindred mm. spirit where you like want to have a, a good time, but you just don't want to go too far. So uh, I'll tell you an example. So, so um, we had two guys who were competing for a position. We leave names out of it now. But what they did was they said, okay, um, the squad's divided in two and we're going to divide it further. But, you, you know, Team red team versus green team, you know, uh, on on the island type thing. You're going to box it out three rounds, bare knuckle boxing, okay, mm -hmm. and then the winner advances and the loser goes to there, and then that team has a much worse trial to do for the next one. So the the one of the players in a starting position now the other guy, and the other guy's actually quite a handy. So he knocks him clean out, okay. Pick him up, water on the face, go again. It's not over. The three minutes has bang. I mean. Head trauma, <laughs> like you know, you know, and everyone's going at that stage. Everyone's yeah. going, mm, and you've got sort of like Selborne Boom and like guys that I really respect. I mean, Selborne Boom would have been in the trenches in in First World War, saying, "Okay, we probably shouldn't go over the top, but follow me." You know, yeah. he would have, yeah. he would have, he would have gone. Yeah, but he wouldn't have agreed with it. And here, he didn't agree with it, but he was there. He was going, mm, "Guys, we, we've just given three quite serious head traumas to our." Probably our, our starting oh. player in that position. It sounds what a bit the like hell are we Jesus. doing? It sounds a bit like Leicester on the back of the bus. If you ever hear yeah. the stories there, like when I I've heard some of those they're, stories they're choosing yeah, yeah. to do that, yeah. they're not being forced. No, to no, that. they're not. You know, well, so, so our initiation, I think, was singing a song, having a few beers, or I had to drink with every member of the Wasp squad. I talk about it in my book, and Sean Edwards took me home, and it, yeah, and I was like, I managed to survive. And then I had to go to Auschwitz the next day, sit next to Craig Dowd on an unair conditioned bus for four hours while he took up all the space. That was terrifying. And then trying not to be sick in one of the most emotionally draining places on earth. Yeah. You know, basically a, a complete place of death. Um, so that was pretty bad. But Leicester, you know, you play, they're like, take the back seat. You know, like, you've got to get to the back seat, yes, you know, and, yes, and they yes. make you run. So, and then they fill you in. And it's like, you, I remember they did try to do that at Wasp once, went to Asker. <laughs> and they're like, Craig White, the guy I've just interviewed for my podcast, said, Has, you just need to get off the bus, just leave this. Like Everyone's steaming. I was only 17, just go off. So I got a car home. They reckon that they, um, they got everyone went, right, start the back, start the front of the bus and work your way to the back. And they ran. And they reckon that the lads, some guy popped up, whack, straight in his punch, straight in his face, head button him, elbowing him, shooing him. <laughs> the other guy just went, no, I'm okay. I'm not. I'm absolutely not going to do that. And that wasn't that wasn't optional. But Leicester, they would do that week in, week out. When they lost the Heineken Cup, I think to us, they destroyed the bus. The bus came back with something like <laughs> ten grand's worth of damage. They like tore the tables out, smoked Devron. I saw a guy get um, booted down a set of stairs. He never played again. He like, did his did his knee, and th and that's when his moments were like, we all like a drink, we all like <laughs> a laugh. But I'd be like you going, 
I'm actually all right. Well, you're a fucking pussy. I'm like, no, well, I'm actually all right. I'm I, actually all right. But I'll tell you where the, the, the problem with it comes in is that it, it's built in, if it's built into the culture, that's what happens. So Stellenbosch, initiation was exactly the same. You know, you get, you get absolutely whacked by your teammates, but then welcome to the, t- you got a sort of a blood bond forever, which yeah. is amazing if you get through. But if you're not, if, you, if you're on the sort of precipice, like we were in a, in a residence in, in Stellenbosch University and it was Fucking amazing. It was just the best, best, best time of your life. 70% women, 30% men, biggest rugby club in the world. But but next to us was a residence which was, I think, 16 or 17 floors. We were sort of three floors. We were one of the ones where, you know, smaller looks concertina. They were straight up. And on the top of their residence, they had a blue chicken, but a big sort of polystyrene blue chicken. It was their symbol. It was on their rugby jersey. And obviously every year someone tells a story, oh, someone, someone used to steal, you know, go. So myself and my roommate, and, and this was probably the least well-planned bivouac that has ever happened in the history of the game. Okay, so we've gone in, and I had a friend who'd, who'd studied um, at Maritzburg University and, and come to Stellenbosch later, but he'd gone into that res next door to us. But most of my mates were in my res, and it was very big rivalry or whatever. Anyway, so we sort of went in and, and I said, oh, I'm looking for this guy, gave his name, and I think I know where he is. And we were just, you know, we probably had a few beers in the afternoon, bold and brave. We got into the back stairwell and worked our way up and got to 16th floor. Now, 17th floor, obviously we don't know this. Afterwards, they tell us there's, there's two guys who live either side of the small stairway to the padlocked opening to the roof where the chicken is because that's where they do their ceremonial stuff and there's just no ways you're going to be and on the 17th floor it's all ex-army students who've done three years in the army and then go in okay so we sort of but we're there and we're sort of rattling around we're thinking how do, how do we you know like myself and my roommate trying to whisper but when you're whispering you're actually being real loud no, no, real much louder shh, 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 shh. I got this I got this next thing is can I help you um no uh, well actually yes because a friend of ours is here and he's studying here and I think they said that he anyway but now we're going but now there's a two guy just goes bing an alarm going next thing within about three minutes there are 60 guys in the room who have lo- spent the last three years qualifying for, in the army, okay, right. paid for to go to university now. So they're, they're all smart sergeants, whatever. They've been beating people up. Beating <laughs> <laughs> just, so we looking. So the guys say to us, okay, well, now we are going to fuck you up <laughs> properly. All right. So, and I'm with, and my, my, my roommate's with me, and he goes, I think we're just going to have to talk our way out of this one. I said, look, let's just, let's see what we can do. And the guy says, look, this, we've filled the room, but there is a door at the other side. If you get to the door, you can go free. Wow. If you don't, then your evening's not going to end right now. So I'd, I had no idea what to do, but my mate was starting to talk. He's a very, very good, very good negotiator. <laughs> but he was, he was talking, need to be. he was talking, talking, and I, and I saw a gap. So I just went and I accelerated and I took, I took about, three or four of the first guys with me and I got about halfway across and then he realized I'd gone and then he's in and it's, you know, it's, I mean, it was 60 against two. <laughs> you know what they did to us? Well, they, they took cans of shoe polish. They tarred and feathered us. They, they ripped open a pillow. Sure. Uh, they took black shoe polish, like humiliate the humiliation of all time. <laughs> And then they just sent us trooping back across the lawn to our res. <laughs> well, I love that though, but I, I thought because I thought we said I filled you in, but tarring and feathering no, you. No, I tell the story. I've never told that story in public before, so it's probably the worst place ever to <laughs> yeah, tell. But yeah. no one you listens to this. Good worry. on them. They knew what we were doing. We were messing them around, and and the tradition was if we stole the thing, we would have ribbed them for years about it. Yeah. So you know, and we had that, and it was it was actually fantastic. That's I mean, amazing. Send you back as blue chickens. Tarred, like imagine like <laughs> finding someone doing that. that. I, I think I spent about seven hours in the shower trying to get black you know that black yeah the boot, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah scrubbed on you for an hour and a half your hair as well all over hair Jesus. Everything. Wait, what a good like, imagine <laughs> them but the thing is i used to know a couple of people who used to work on the doors in london and they used to um if someone started on them in fights all the time they'd always try to attack the doorman they'd knock you out they'd take your belt and they'd take your shoes and uh, when, when you wake up, you'd be having to walk home holding your trousers up barefoot, and oh. just obviously with a black eye, knowing you got fucked up. 
Imagine just looking out the window and seeing Bobby Skinstad and his mate just tarred and feathered in their pants just walking home. Just you'd be, across the lawn. Be like, <laughs> it would be amazing. And that's why you think now, like stuff like that, thank God camera phones aren't, oh, aren't right. But what? But I would have loved just a little, somebody somewhere might have a Polaroid or something like that. Jeez, I hope not. <laughs> I hope so. Whoever's listening to this, if you have a picture no, of Bobby Skinstad and tarred and feathered, right. send it in. We'll get our social media team to mock something. Yeah. That'll go viral in no time. Um... I don't really want to go from that to the accident, but I do want to ask you about the accident because it, it, I mean, it changed. Did it change everything? Um, it did. It's a funny, so I'll, I'll tell you a sequence of events and then, and then it definitely changed things. I mean, I, I, I've, got, I've got quite strong feelings about whether it, I would, obviously I can't do it again or whether I would have it happen to me again. Um, we beat the Crusaders on that day yeah. and I went into their change room. Todd Blackadder was the captain. Todd was filthy when they lost. He hated it. But it, what a great guy. I mean, one of, the, one of the great guys of rugby, one of the most amazing gentlemen of rugby. But I said to him, listen, there's a place called The Green Man. used to be owned by Joel Stransky um, and uh, Torrington, someone Torrington, Trevor Torrington, I think, um, in, in the Claremont area. It was, a sun, it was a funny old game because it was Sunday at 5 o'clock and there weren't a lot of games on a, on a Sunday and they weren't the best games. And on a Sunday, less people would come and, and there'd be less happening. Anyway, we'd smash them. We were really upbeat. And I, I went in to thanks for their game, et cetera. And I said to, um, uh, well, I, I, I said to the team, I suppose, and, and, and Todd was part of that. And I said, listen, we've, we've got these guys to keep the green man open. Um, I think I'd got in trouble for having everybody at my house, <laughs> the, the, the Reds, Guinness two, two weeks before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but we're going to go to the green man. Um, afterwards, uh, you know, why don't you come around? And what happened was they did a bit of a team lock-in and they, they got absolutely smashed. And that team had, won the Super Rugby that year but had lost, I think, five in a row or, 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 or that was their fifth loss in a row and they'd, they'd been champions before. And they, they had one of those sort of break in the season like, and then, yeah. you know, everybody was chugging beers, let's admit all our faults, Let's chuck it out there. And, and like, like only Kiwis can, you yeah, know, like yeah. out there. And then we're best mates the next day, which <laughs> yeah. they bloody did well and came back and won. Um, so they ended up turning up at the Green Man, but two and a half hours late and blitzed. Right. And, and Justin Marshall, who is a mate of mine, and, and I love Marshy, he's played over here, et cetera. But he came in and, he, you know, half an hour this way. And he, he made a comment, which is very unbecoming of him to my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife. And I'd, it was something about, are oh, you the, the piece of whatever it fluff for tonight type thing. And I, I'd, I think I'd, we'd played a game. We'd also then, you know, you'd waited two and a half hours. So you'd had a few beers with your mates and, and on the sauce and that kind of thing. And, and I flipped, I said, well, you know, that's, I'm, I'm not going to fight to this guy. You know, in fact, that did you hear what he said, et cetera. Anyway, and I left and my girlfriend and my brothers were with me. I think my brothers were, it was a um, school holiday and they were staying at our house, et cetera. And I said to her, you take them home. And I drove my own car straight out of there and across and the Claremont Bridge and I accelerated. I was driving at the time, I was sponsored by Ford and I was driving an XR6 Falcon. Yeah, wow. which is the fastest saloon car in the world at that time. Completely wasted on me, can I say? Because I'm so terrible with cars. I can't remember what size. I don't know engines. I don't know anything. I would have driven a, you know, just a pickup truck and been absolutely delighted. Anyway, they'd, they'd given me that. And I just picked up speed. There was a bit of rain and skidded across and crashed into the, into the bridge. And I lifted my knees up and the dashboard came and I got a grade three tear on the left, grade two and a half tear on the right of posterior cruciate because it knocked my knee oh, Jesus. that way. So we didn't know. And then I basically limped the, the car home. The whole front was smashed, sort of um, airbag out and, and parked. And I was helping a friend of mine in Johannesburg the next morning. I was on a six o'clock flight the next morning and speaking at a lunch for them. And they were raising money for a, I think PwC or, or one of the auditing firms was doing a rugby tour to the end of year tour, yeah. the end of the year, and they were raising money to get the guys to do that. So I went and did the fundraiser do with Sean Pollock and Hansi Crenier. Oh wow! Oh wow! And and this is weird, but we we sat there, and now I was obviously disappointed and in a lot of pain, but I didn't want to admit that there was something wrong, and I certainly couldn't tell them 
that anything had happened. And um, I stood up to speak and I, I could hardly get up and I, the fluid was obviously going and I'd done a flight and I did this speech about how we built a team. The Western Province had, had built a team and the culture and, and we were talking about, and Hansi did a speech about, you know, that's a nice story, but it's actually about all the individuals doing their job rather. And then, and I, I'll never ever forget it. I don't know why, but for those 10 minutes, and I, and I look back on that now, and he was going through having death threats sent to him because he was starting to take the, the money, pressure bribes. and bribes, et cetera, because he'd made a mistake and he'd gone the wrong side. And you can imagine going, well, I don't want this young sort of happy-go-lucky prick to come here and tell me what to do. It's not about team. It's about and it was individual stuff. So it was quite a heady sort of thing, and it, it, that affected me for a long time. So... And then I so spent did, about he, a, did he say that, did he sort of he went against you in the way he spoke? Yeah, he, just gave he, it the, he spoke off to me and he was like, "Look, that's a nice story, and you can do all the team stuff, but actually, it's about you know, if you're eleven in a cricket team, you have to have eleven performers. You can't." Right. So it wasn't. So you're saying a million yeah, miles. Yeah, you're saying because you 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 were injured in pain and and emotionally all over the place because you fucked yourself, and then a hit well like a South African sort of legend then comes at you and just sort of melts yeah, your head. I, 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 so it melted my head right. big time. Yeah, and I and and then we went back to Cape Town that night, late that night, and um and then I got a sort of a, a quick diagnosis from our physio, and I knew I was in proper trouble. You had a bit of PTSD. Oh, definitely, hundred percent, definitely, and I've just had a car crash. So I mean, yeah, we know, would have had that. Been, I mean, yeah. yeah, but I just mean as well, just from the emotional point of view, where someone. Mm. You know, in those situations as well, because ordinarily the process in those dinners as well, no one would normally challenge. Like if you and I got out, I would, I would re. If you said something, I mean, unless it was so controversial, you wouldn't ordinarily go against it. You no. might, you might go, oh, well, actually, that's really interesting. You know, another part of that, but for sort someone's of a go, complimentary yeah. conversation someone's, starter, yeah, yeah, yeah. fuck, you, you must have been all over the place. But also, also, you know, you, when you say, did that change everything? You know, I was twenty-three. Mm. You know, captain of this team. You got the weight of the world in your shoulders. All the stuff is going on, and I, I mean, I haven't even dealt with that. I haven't, I haven't properly dealt with that. But it was now that I'm my age, forty five. I can look back and go, Jesus, you know, I wish there was a way to f reach out to understand how to deal with the whatever. Anyway, of course, to change things. Because me... what? How long were you? You were out for a long old time. I was. Uh, well, so so the problem there was that was ninety nine. Yeah, and. I came back and played in the 99 World Cup. Yeah. And I never had an operation. So the – I can't do it. I've got to show – you've got to show Fucking hats. Fucking hell. I I know you've, you've prepped this before. I didn't want to see this. Is this the Oh, my God. I mean, that's like – Oh, mate. No. No, I don't I know, actually need – yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, you, if you're listening to this. It, it disappears. Oh, shit. We're basically, Sorry, watching, we're, we're basically watching a spade in the sand just going around in circles. <laughs> yeah, you are. I mean, it's like, on cam, you're on that camera. Uh, There's a main oh, cam geez. as well. No, but it's, I mean, that's, a, that's a, it's quite a common injury in NFL. Um, and in baseball, the catchers get it. Oh, yeah. Because when the guy slides into them. Yeah. So a car accident trauma, your, 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 your knee stays in the same place and your shin goes backwards. And it's a PCL. And there's specialists and surgeons in the States, but there were no real specialists on that in South Africa. So we had a, um, uh, like a, a arthroscopy and the guy was, well, we can, you know, let's get it into a cast. And it was into a cast. And then I, I uh, sort of came back, played, a, played two warm-up games for Stellenbosch. Great story. I strapped my right knee, okay? It was the left knee that was done. Played a warm-up game for Stellenbosch against Think, came out, and my right knee had been ripped to shreds by the opposition, <laughs> <laughs> just stamping all over my right knee. So, And I knew that if it was the left knee, they would have gone for it. So I strapped my right really? knee. Really? <laughs> Unbelievable. You know, people always talk about that and say, you know, I remember uh, the, on the, uh, the, the talk sport coverage I was doing on the weekend, they sent someone to a different pub, and it was obviously standard rugby fans. And they went, and there were some South Africans in the mm. in the bar, and they asked a question, and they went, "Yeah, you know, probably target uh, Alwyn Jones's shoulder, right?" It's what they said, like, is it? But and I, I just said, no one's like, no one does that, like trying to uh, purposely target someone. But I love that actually back in the day, you could, you know, you had to try to strap the other knee because yeah. you knew that they were going to do I that. Because you can't do that now. They, when people say target it, you might get them on it. You wouldn't do it. But we still have working. Yeah, you know, mate, that's <laughs> mad. That's mad. <laughs> One of the one of the things we love most on this show there was a comeback, and you obviously—I mean, you, your journey is extraordinary as, as a player. You, you put the whole lot away and went into business. You came over here, obviously, did the mm. Dragons, and then went mm. into business, and were going great guns. I'd love to know how you did 
the, how the comeback happened for you? Because you then, out of nowhere, go back and win a World Cup, which is sort of part of your story and only you could tell that. But I mean, <laughs> how did you go from putting it in the bin, moving into business, and then suddenly standing on a winner's podium? I mean, it was it was, it was really weird because I'd been here working at Saatchi. We'd, we'd, we'd started doing sort of sport in advertising. We'd picked up some accounts. We were... And, and it was going very well. And luckily, the chairman of Saatchi, CEO chairman at that stage, um, was a Kiwi who loved rugby. And I worked with a fantastic Kiwi, uh, Owen Eastwood, actually, who wrote that book, Belonging. Yes. So, oh, yeah. I know Owen very well. Yeah. He, yeah, he used to work at Lewis Silkin as well. That's yeah, right. Yeah, really so good Owen's guy. An, an, an amazing guy. And, and he worked with the guy who had um, paid for me to come over to Newport, um, Tony Brown. And he, the family owned um, Bisley Office Furniture and he made loads of money but it was out of Newport. So he bought the Newport Rugby Club and he used to fund players coming in and Gary Tashman came and, and Monty came, him, Monty came okay. over and Monty and I played a, a, a couple of games together. But basically I got there and I was sort of six weeks in and I was like, I just do not want to be here and I do not want to do this. So I wrote Tony Brown a letter and I said, look, I'm really, I was the highest paid rugby player in the world at that stage. Right? For six weeks, which is nice, but <laughs> exactly. it's, not, it's not an amazing career builder. <laughs> and I wrote him a letter and he said, well, I, you know, I want to meet you for breakfast. And I thought, oh God, he's going to say, well, I've got a watertight contract. You're going nowhere, whatever. And he, he walked in and he, and he just tore up my signature page of the contract. He said, mate, life's got many twists and turns. And if you don't want to be here, I absolutely get it. Thank you for a lovely letter. Hail fellow, well met. Anytime you can come back, chat, whatever. Good luck on your journey. Wow. He, and, he, and, he, and he canceled my, my contract. So obligation free, I could then go work to Tsarchi, came and played at Richmond. Yeah. Uh, played a few that. games with my brother and loved it. Did some, some work. That's when you and I met. And yeah. or a year later, that's when you and I met. And um, what, it was an amazing what, what, time. What was it you'd fallen out of love with? I just had a, you know, we, the, the Stormers had, had done, yeah. you know, what the Stormers had done. And um, Gert Smal came in. Gert and I, Gert Smal is a... Um, a very, very talented rugby coach, but but he was learning to be a man manager and yeah. he was quite oppressive and that that never works for me. You know, it's like we're going to collaborate and we're going to win or it's not going to happen. You, yeah. You're not going to tell me to be in a square, you know, hole and, and, and so, so we just, we were at each other's throats. It was just not a nice environment and, and, you know, and we still, I mean, we talk about it. So I went to see him, we'll have a beer about it, but it was just, you know, two people not. And, and so I went to the Cats for a year, but trying to find another coach. Tim Lane was there, I tried to find another coach. But I, I think the love had just been squeezed out of me yeah. for a bit. And, and, and because of that, I, I went back and played the amateur um, rugby rather over here. I was going to ask you, a couple, well, a couple of times you talked about kind of obviously with the car accident stuff and the adjustment and about how you liked um, coaches to kind of communicate with you. What was your mental side of the game like? Obviously, I know we, we know Alex. We're going to come on to the, the, the kind of comeback and how that manifests itself. But what were you? Were you strong mentally? Did you? Because I know I, I've always talked quite a lot about uh, having self confidence issues. Mm. Again, I was somebody that needed an arm around them. Mm. Um, I didn't, you know, trying to fit me into a in like a square peg into a round hole mm. again. Like you said, didn't work, and it was something that I had to work very hard on. Mm. I wonder. You know, when that game went pro professional, I doubt the mental side, especially for men in South Africa was something you guys talked about. Is that something you struggle with it and on reflection now where you are? Because you said you kind of wanted to change things perhaps mm. where you've done things or, or maybe address some of that yeah. stuff. You said you hadn't addressed it. What is your view on how you were and what you, you know, what you need to probably sort out now? Well, I, I mean, I think it, it's so important and, and I'm just delighted that the players and, and people are addressing it and, and getting better at it. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of talking that needs to happen. There's a lot of, Post events is a lot of healing that needs to happen, um, and and you know you, you you spoke about it. You you're in the spotlight. You the golden boys. Like you can't have problems. No, mm. you know we we my, my parents went, went through quite a difficult financial situation at the time of me starting to earn money from rugby. So I was siphoning off money to my parents. To and my dad was a doctor. He was an amazing doctor, just a terrible businessman. So, he, you know, he, he bought the wrong bloody, he, he bought the whole building that his practice was in and people were skiving money off him. It had nothing to do with what he was good at and that was being a doctor. But then suddenly, because I had money and we're a family, you know, you step in. And, and so I had all of that pressure as opposed to that being, okay, you know, well, you know, let's look after your mind. How are you with, with yeah, X? Yeah. So, so nothing's, nothing's going to be um, perfect. And, and I don't, regret any of it but i i definitely think that um 
the openness that people are using with sportsmen and women now is is more um the, the empathetic approach is a better one you know it's not just hey you know telly ho yeah. um just just shut get, up and get, get on shut up and yeah. get on with it i'm incredibly lucky that that has i've probably had the blowouts yeah and then i've i've met people so i've started to deal with that so i've i've got my own failings i've got complete i'm terrified that that i'm com uh, permanently living a an imposter imposter syndrome, syndrome yeah, yeah. lifestyle you know and you you know and 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 i've worked through some of that stuff at work i've 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 and and nothing solved. Um, it's never it's never but it's, evolving it, process. Exactly. You never you, you never you fix a, it. Address it exactly. Yep. So so I think at that time, absolutely undercooked on the solution oriented stuff. And and also, the South African male is not really the kind of person who reaches out for help. And the society is not one that that says, okay, well you know let's see dad's problems and let's yeah. deal with that type thing. It's like you need to be the stoic leader at the front just dealing with everything and, and it should be okay. So, I mean, it's a great question. And, and I, I would absolutely say that any money that's being put into sport there needs to address that as part of one of the responsibilities of the teams and the unions for mm -hmm. kids coming through, because, you know, you, you, you're heaping a big amount of, of future problems on kids who are, you know, just out there performing for you. So there's a whole future that you're going to have with them, you know. And when you sort of had that time off, obviously you then kind of got mentally refreshed, I would imagine. Because yeah, because when, yeah. when Alex, because I didn't, to be honest with you, I didn't realise, obviously you knew you won the World Cup, but I didn't realise there was this middle part where you'd gone and mm. done that because I'm not sure what the hell I was doing. I think I was just, I think. You were in at school. Yeah, I think 2007 was, at, well, when you at, played the World Cup was my first year playing for England. I just, mm. 21, I just played for, for England. So I sort of missed this stuff. So I mm. wonder whether, you started working in London, you got that refresh, mm. that refreshment. And then mm. how did you, how was the next step into that? So, so I, I, and I'm very proud and happy about this, but basically I, I sort of played a few games for Richmond and they were great because I was working quite hard and I couldn't play all the games, but they allowed me to play. Ego wanted me to play center and wing and bag around and not. So I played, I played in the back line with my brother, loved it. Then we battled a bit second half of the season. I came back and played seven and eight and, and, you know, Richmond had been dropped down all those leagues. Do you remember? Yeah, I remember it. Yeah, 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 yeah. They, they were my first ever team I supported when they had Dominic Chapman, exactly. the Quinnell brothers. So it wasn't, was the guy that went bust. that's right. Yeah. It, it, it certainly wasn't in those heady days. It was once they'd been bust for going um, bankrupt and yeah. dropped all the way down, had to make it. I think about five seasons in a row, they, they won the league and then yes. came back up. And I mean, the Richmond group are just, just an amazing bunch of players and people and, and they rallied around it. But because I'd played for Richmond, the Barbars phoned up and said, what the hell are you doing? Are, are, are you available? Because, you know, and I was like, I am fully available. So I played, I played um, Portugal, two Portugal tours, two Georgia tours, America tour, Argentina tour, England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Army, Navy, Cambridge game, Oxford game every year for two and a half years. Oh my. So I think in that era, I think I was like that? the, I think it was like the most kept modern day barbarian. <laughs> you know what I mean? Social so segment. are you available? Yes. How yes, good was I, it? How was, good was it? That? Was, I, that was one thing I never got to do and I would oh. have loved to have done it. It seems like it would be next level amazing. Mate, it was unbelievable. It was just, you know, so I mean, we played, I played for the Barbars against Scotland in Scotland. Brian O'Driscoll at centre, Christian Cullen at fullback, Tane Randall at, at eight next to me, oh, Malcolm O'Kelly. Um, I mean, it was ju just the most unbelievable teams and players or whatever. And drift, I, I was, I was, you know, fit ish, but not in the same shape as the other guys. So I could sort of, I could play a role where, you know, I don't have to start here. And, and we, it was just amazing. <laughs> so, so, so you're, you're, you're showboating and lo loving life. And then was it Jake White who? Picked no, up the so phone? Jake White came um, to London and Dick Muir came to London and they watched, we played Barbos against England and we beat England. Um, in May, yeah. May yeah, in, you know, the season, before Jamboree's, exactly, yeah. and um, we beat a, a youngish England side, and um, I got a phone call a couple of days later. They said, "Look, we're building a squad for Super Rugby for next year, and we're looking for a, an overweight, slow, loose <laughs> forward. <laughs> we're building our our portfolio." <laughs> And what about coming back? And my wife was pregnant at the time. And I thought, you know, we've, we've been in the UK, really enjoyed it. Um, I'd actually been offered a post, Saatchi Saatchi in, in Cape Town, um, which I couldn't make work because then I said, okay, yes, I will come back and play. 
Um, but then I thought to myself, well, if I'm going to play, I, I want to have a go. There's a World Cup coming up. And they said, we've spoken to Jake. Jake said, if you're around, there's an outside chance, which he probably said to 500 different players. Um, but I, I then went back and, and Dick Muir was the coach of that chalk side and, and we made it to the final and I got picked for that 2007 World Cup on the back of that. And it obviously comes full circle because you then end up winning the thing. I mean, it, it's interesting, but actually I've, I've never heard you speak about the sort of the journey you've been on in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, into the spotlight, et cetera. But did that feel like sort of closure? Did that feel like job done or was it just sort of part of... No, no, no. It, I mean, it felt, uh, to be honest, I was here in London and, and Debs was heavily pregnant. In fact, we just lived up the road from where we are now, at Hurlingham Gardens Road. And, and she was heavily pregnant. And I, was, I came home at night after work and we were working on some, some big stuff with, with um, a, a German brand and I'd been traveling a lot. And I was pacing up and down, thinking options, thinking. And eventually she came out. She was like, Jesus, can, you, can, you, can we stay or go? But I cannot, I can't sleep. And I, you know, she's heavily pregnant or whatever. <laughs> my, daughter got, my daughter got born, born here. Um, and, and I said, okay, 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 okay. Well, I'll make a decision. And then, so I made the decision and then we went back. And, and you know, that year being part of the team at the Sharks, um, but with an older head, I don't know how you feel, James. You, you, I'm sure you would, you'd have different lenses that you've seen teams. I mean, I went back to the Sharks. I actually didn't give a shit if I made the team or not, but I said to myself, I am going to be stronger than everybody yeah. in my position. So, I mean, my wife, I had nothing to do. I lived on a, on a little estate right near Butch James and, and John Smith. No booze, no, nothing except being the optimal athlete for like six and a half months. And I got into the best shape of my life um, I mean, even John Plumtree was like, I was skeptical about you coming back. You were overweight and under speed or whatever. He said, but now I get it, you know, and he doesn't compliment anybody. No, no. You know, Plumtree is a lovely guy, but, but so, so I had that sort of focus to do that. And then that team did very well, was very well coached. We, we, um, us and the bulls were, were, you know, in, in good nick. So we had a good squad together, went to the world cup. I mean, not a lot of people know this, but I've, I've only ever been dropped from a rugby team once in my entire life. And I got dropped after the semi-final or the final. I say dropped. We knew bloody England, I say that, went and beat their semi-finalists when they were supposed to be knocked out. They were supposed to be knocked out in the quarters. They were supposed to be knocked out in the quarters. And I was part of the starting loose forwards, uh, part of the starting four yeah. loose forwards in, uh, for, for France on our game plan, but not for England. Right. Because we had a defensive game plan because we felt that that English side were not going to outscore us. They were going to play a very different game. But Argentina played semi-final because Argentina and France had a very similar um, style. So I knew I was going to be dropped or well, the squad was going to change. And Vickers van Heerden and I had trained together and he was completely out he was out the squad he thought he wasn't going to make it and then the next morning and we mates and we trained together and he was in and we knew and jake was walking down the passage and i was like you know when the, yeah. you just want to melt and say just change your mind do something but anyway he and i was then out of the match day 23 um for the world for the final but uh, you know i played the semi was on yeah. the field and 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 loved it to bits but my replacement vickers van Heerden, went on and won a penalty France Stain put it over from the halfway line. I couldn't have won that penalty. He was a forager. They, you know, someone made, I think Skulk Berger made the tackle. He was over the top. I wouldn't have made that. And that was the beauty of Jake knowing who should be playing in that team. So huge disappointment not making it, but a huge, for me, if that had been 23 year old me, yeah. I would have been, I don't know what reaction would have come off, you know, but 31 year old me was like, that is absolutely the right thing. And did, did you genuinely feel, I mean, I know you would have been disappointed, but did you genuinely, because you don't strike me as someone who would go and kick stones and you seem like a, a very good team man. But, you know, there obviously must have been quite a lot of emotion, but then did you feel like still part of it? Because I, I would oh, have. I, I, I felt hugely part of it. I did, I did, not a lot of people, you know, know how much I went through. I, um, I went out that night and I got very, very pissed with a very good friend of mine and I sang Bruce Springsteen songs with a pocket of Argentinian rugby supporters in, in the Rula Swaf, in that, in that yeah. place, you know, where they, yeah, they yeah. had all the supporters till like four in the morning. They couldn't find me the next morning. I'd, I'd, I stayed at the flat with my, my, my friend from Cape Town 
I, 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 but I needed to heal. Fine, fine. But I okay. needed to heal. And, 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 and the Wednesday was the day off. Yeah. I needed to heal. Like, so I got back to the hotel at like one o'clock. Butch James had been texting me, where are you? What's going on? Are you okay? You know? And when I got back, he, he realized it was just, I needed to just, Arms length it. It sounds a bit and, like a thing out of a movie where like yeah. everyone's trying to have a good time and you're there seeing Bruce Lee crying. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I like can you get this guy off? Like <laughs> he, he won't leave. Like, he won't go. Oh, he's crying himself. By myself. <laughs> where, Fuck off, skins dad, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> where is the medal nowadays? Sock drawer? Oh, I you'd have to ask Dibs. I don't, I, oh, really? I don't know actually. Yeah, he's in a box somewhere along with your yeah. baggy jeans yeah, and yeah, exactly. <laughs> moving <laughs> SA to 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 um, UK. No, I don't know. Not on display, that's for sure. It's a hell of a journey. It's a <laughs> hell of a story with, with some extraordinary twists and turns. Would you do all over again? Or are you... No, you done I, I, in, a, in a heartbeat. I'd, I'd do some a bit different. Yeah. Um, I regret not having a chance to maybe play in a Japan yeah. or a, and not for the money side. I'd, I wish I could have a foreign language or something like that. I can, I can speak pretty good Afrikaans, but you know, I don't have French, I don't have Spanish, I don't have something like that. And, and I just see more and more these days. That's, it's just another arrow in the quiver. Yeah. Um, I, I've, I've got four kids, four happy, healthy kids. I, I think if I'd done that, I wouldn't have had four kids. Yeah. And so then I would have missed out on that. So there's not a hell of a lot I would have, I would have changed, but um, I, I, I definitely feel really blessed to have, have played it and, and, and be part of the, 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 the whole sort of having sport as a vocation yeah. when it wasn't even an option when I started. Yeah. I've, I've, this, I think this is one of my most enjoyable interviews yeah, because absolutely. we were going to sit down and talk Lions and actually your backstory is just... <laughs> and I just I, you know, I can remember the headlines of, of you being the, 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 the Bex box or the box Bex or whatever it was back in the day. And it's just, what a remarkable career. It is so nice to gallop through the old days with you. It's been an absolute um, treat, Bob. I just want to talk about the Lions before we go because obviously... We're in the middle of something quite special at the moment with what's going on in South Africa. Um, as we said a bit earlier on, what a remarkable start to the series. It was on Saturday. It had pretty much everything. Physical, brutal. We had comebacks. It went all the way to the wire. Um, very little to separate the two at the end. A remarkable turnaround, actually, if you are a Lions fan. Nine points down, uh, 19 points in the second half to win it. A show of might from Warren Gatland and his men, led by the bionic man, Alan Wynne-Jones, as we said. Um, in fact, I think Tins got pretty close, didn't he, to our... Man of the match predictions. He went with Courtney, who I have to say, Mario was immense. You could have given it to either of them, but Mario, the man who ended up with it. Um, lots more drama and tension forecast for this weekend. I hope you're booked in to watch it wherever you've got your telly box. Uh, just a reminder, if you haven't and you don't want to miss out, it is all to play for. Sky Sports is the only place to watch it. 18 quid extra per month for non-Sky Sports customers. For more details, head to sky.com forward slash sports. It's only live once. We say it every week. Do not miss it. This could be the series sealer. It could be the series equaliser. We shall see. I would love to get a few thoughts on what happened and what will happen at the weekend. First of all, though, Rassiness. Have you seen this Rassiness Twitter, Twitter I stuff? Or not? I okay, haven't. So the, I haven't. So the story is that he's tw he's tweeted himself from a burner account and then retweeted it. And I don't necessarily want to get into the semantics of that, but knowing him as you do, where will he be right now off the back of what happened on Saturday? I think he'll be seriously disappointed um, because he'll know he made some strategic errors. Um, he'll feel that they could have won. He'll never feel that they should have won. He's not that kind of coach. He, he'll he'll react, um, but he'll feel that 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 they let themselves down to be in a situation where they then did lose. You know what I mean? Like that. I think that the coaches made a mistake. That that there's no ways you should have a dominant forty go off the field, have a 12-minute break, and bring on a new front three. It should be the same guys. Come on, finish the job. Give me eight, nine, ten minutes of your best while I'm going to get these other guys, pressure cooker, warm, ready, and then they come on at 50 minutes. Yeah. You know, it's just a, it's a, it's a dead atmosphere. If, you know, you go on, thanks for all your work. Now, can you sit there right now? I'm going to talk to the other guy in your role. Yeah. It just doesn't work. You no. know, it's been done so little in – club rugby, world rugby, test match rugby, that it would have been foreign to them. They come onto the field. They got bossed. They got absolutely bossed by the the area, scrums, from, they, from, yeah. from the kickoff, then to the penalty, then to the driving line out. You know, you've got, you've got a bigger, stronger front row that the Lions just smashed and scored a, a driving try. I mean, for me, there was a message. I said, uh-oh, we're in trouble. Yeah. So strategically, he will be... He'll be so gutted because he'll feel that that's his mistake, not not just the players' mistakes. Although he'll feel some of them did make mistakes as well. 
How good was it? You were doing talk sport. I was, yeah. I mean, I, you know, it was so... Yeah. It's interesting, before the tour, I was quite confident that the Lions were going to do a job because of just the obvious nature of the fact that South Africans hadn't played, yeah. you know, and, yeah. you know, all sort of the super super rugby wasn't so super, as you said. Um, and then when I saw that A game, uh, uh, you know, and a lot of these players, you know, you'll know better than anyone. When you talk about playing to a level, you think you know until you face that level and you're mm. like, oh, shit, we didn't know. Mm. I think the best thing that could have happened to the Lions team was playing against that A side. Mm. Because they just came out and everything that all the attention to detail bits or all the stuff that requires no skill, i.e. how quickly you chase the ball, how quickly you go off the floor, how hard you hit someone, mm. you know, those don't require any skill, but they mm. should be at international levels and Lions levels be at the, the, the top. And South Africa were here and the Lions were here. And then we sort of got it together in the second half. And I went into it going, Christ, you know, my, my head says Lions, my heart, oh, sorry, head says South Africa. My heart says lions. And then I watched that first half. And, and for once, I was actually on edge of the seat stuff mm. because, you know, there was um, the first kind of few seconds, I thought, wow, the lions have turned up here. Like we're mm. in a good, good position. And then South Africa just did what they did so well. And it was, you know, I was going into going ha at half time going, this is, we're going to struggle here a little yeah. bit. I think, you know, we can't seem to keep the composure. You know, there was that phase in the second half. I think we were just throwing, shoveling shit mm. down the line. Mm. And, you know, I actually caught myself doing what I always hated, which is as a commentator or someone in the media or someone in the stand. It's very easy to see what you should do. Yeah. And I was sitting there commentating, going, well, you know, they need to, need to hold on to the ball and stop forcing it. And I went, actually, I'm so sorry, because this is what people used to level at me. Well, why the fuck are you doing the same thing? But you don't know mm. yeah, what yeah. you're doing. And it seemed to be they got the composure. I thought they got lucky with a couple of things. And I thought how easily South Africa, on those two breakaway bits, how easily they scored. Mm. And it was like the old kind of adage, you know, that you can score a try in 30 seconds. You know, your junior coach always tells you that. And you're like, shut up. Right. I remember <laughs> in the 2007 World Cup preparation, Brian Ashton used to say you can score a try in 30 seconds. And Ronnie Regan used to run around and go, right, lads, don't forget it. Score a try in 30 seconds, Bab. You'd be like, Ronnie, shut up. That's what he'd say. And I, as we were doing fitness, he'd see Brian. He'd be like, 30 seconds, lads, score a try, keep the attention. Like, right. I then saw that. You saw that how dangerous yeah. Africa were. Um, and I think it was, a, it, it was amazing for us to get the win. But I don't think South Africa, yes, they should be despondent for exactly what you said, those tactical reasons. But I also think the Lions should feel slightly lucky because mm. on another day, yeah. a couple of those bits, that's a yellow mm. card, mm. that's a try. Mm. Um, you know, but I think it's, it's all to play, play for. And actually, the one thing about it is South Africa are definitely going to get better. You know, now I they've played so. that. Yeah. I think so. I, I, interesting call. Someone said to me, do you, you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And and to be honest, Rusty could go in there and say, okay, guys, well, this is crap, that's crap. We tried this, you know, let's change yeah. all of these. I think they should change very little except Damn. execution. Yeah. You know, and I, I just don't know. I haven't got, unfortunately, on me right now, all of the up-to-date info on injuries because yeah. it looked like Pollard hobbled off. I, I, I hope not because... I'm, I'm not sure that Elton Yankees is a starting flower. What about half. Stain, beat, though? What about bringing Stain in? I think they would leapfrog Stain yeah. straight in. Um, but but I think Pollard was actually, he was okay. You know, that initial dis distribution was good. But I think you nailed it. Like, they, they, they can't and don't need to change everything. They just need to hope for a bit of the, the bounce of the ball, the luck, the rub of the green. Who or what impressed you most about the Lions? Um, I think the, the, the physical nature of um, first half, second half. So, yeah. you know, two, 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 two halves. But w what I liked was, you know, Murrow, Alan Wynn, um, Curry. Um, you know, I suppose even, even if you, if you, if you want to, you know, even the front row, um, they, 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 they were trying to be physical. They were really trying. They, they were just sort of bossed or pushed back a little bit in the first half, but they never stopped. So yeah. by the time halfway through the second half, you know, Murrow's hit maybe the same guy 11 times. Eventually the guy's like, okay, go on, I'll, I'll give you the one meter. He's taken the one meter. They've won the ball back. Yeah. You know, like he was affecting turnovers in the 67th yeah. minute of a test match. He was trying in the 11th minute, not getting it, but not stopping and trying. So I really was impressed with that. It was just a, in, in Afrikaans, you've got this, the saying of on ho or ven, and it, it's like the guy who keeps keeps on going is eventually going to crumble. And and I think that it was more a case of that, as in if we just if we just keep grinding here, we'll we'll get it right. And and it, they did. There was a moment that I saw in the in in a game that I think everybody saw was Maro Toji ran into Eden Etzebeth, 
Right? And you know that a lot of coaches and people talk about one-on-one -on -one battles with people, and you very rarely get them on the on the field. Mm. You know, like if there's um, if you're a back row player and someone gets a, a steal, a breakdown, and you're defending, they always look at you like. There's no, there's 14 other players on yeah, the field. Exactly. It's not my fucking job to go and do that. I can't be there everywhere because it's like when we played Australia. Take out Pocock, Hooper appears. Take out Hooper, Pocock <laughs> appears. Take all them out, Gray appears. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a nightmare. It's the same thing with South Africa. But there was this one moment where Marrow ran into Eden Etzebeth and Eden just like grabbed him, dragged him back, got him in a headlock, right? Choked him. You could see him choke him. Got up, lay on top of him, like properly lay on him, like ground him into the mud. And Marrow sort of didn't do anything. And I was like, uh-oh, this is like, that's a really bad sign. That's the one player that for South Africa has that kind of, you know, he's the first one. I mean, he's the king of grabbing people's shirts and having <laughs> yeah, rough yeah, and tumble. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to see if someone actually belted him, what would happen? Because either he's the biggest fake tough guy ever, <laughs> or he's got something about himself. Because, he's massive. Though, yeah, he's he? massive, but yeah. he's the first no, one. You, mean, you yeah, know yeah. what you mean? Like, why I hate... He's an instigator. Yeah, he's an instigator. Yeah. But what I hate about modern rugby is these lads know there's no danger of someone belting them. Mm. Like, in your era, mm. if I started grabbing a shirt... It could kick off. I could get chinned quite easily. In the modern game, there's always the tough guys come over the top, giving it large, and you're like, you know you're safe. You know you're safe. That's why I never used to run in. My dad would be like, why do you not, you know, so and so is getting filled. And I was like, dad, because you can't do anything. I'm not going to run in and go, fuck off, fuck off, fuck off, fuck off. And the referee goes, whoa, leave it. You're like, I'll fucking get you next time. You're like, no, no you won't, unless you get you legally. <laughs> so he's the king of that. And I thought, oh, he's messed Marrow up. But for me, that was a bit like, we interviewed Simon Shaw and Simon Shaw said that he wasn't the most physical. But when he got hit in the face, you know, you get that moment where you mm. try to do a leg tackle, get kicked in the face. You're like, oh, I either want to go home or I want to front up. Mm. That was Marrow's moment of like, right, okay, fucking I've got man. He, he turned on. it on though. He did, he then turned yeah. it on. And actually, I also think the way that the Lions um, defensively in the second half tackled lower yeah. meant there was more opportunities to steal. Mm. Um, and that's when someone like Courtney came to the form where Marrow in those 60 minutes, people were actually on the deck Instead, of, and there was more time to yeah. to to steal. But I I thought that was a really important moment for me. And also when Mako came on, like mm. I love Cheslin Colby, he's a friend of the show. But you know, we sort of know that rugby's kind of going a little bit towards the old fake footballer kind of thing. And he hit the floor, and you could see him like almost winking, like looking out to see the referee, waiting, to see is he going to get yellow card? No one does anything. Mako just picks him up like a handbag. Goes, fucking not today, son. Get up, pats him on the bum, and shoves, <laughs> shoves him on. And I just think those moments were kind of quite quite key. But there were so many from South Africa, right, when you were, you know, they were so physical and attritional. Mm. And it looked like we'd, we'd got the level right for sort of 10 minutes. And then you're saying we just weren't getting anywhere. We were just getting filled in. And then we kind of got the, yeah. the ascendancy. I think that's... Partly, I think down to fitness, maybe you know, like we, you know, the match fitness. I think, I think that, and and the, you know, the the whole conjecture beforehand. You know, are they are they going to be undercooked? Are they going to be ready, etc. I, I felt the lines got stronger and stronger, definitely. Yeah. And and I think that is what do they call it? Um, you need miles in the legs. Yeah. If you're going to run a marathon, you need miles in the legs. You can't just. The, the, the box and, and fair play to Rassi because after the game he said no complaints here. You know, we were beaten by the better team. But um, that was one of his tweets he put out through his own account. But. I, I was. We were talking about it on air on Sky. It, I've not seen it, particularly a Bok, particularly a top tier one team drop off in the way that they so did quickly, in that second yeah. half. I mean, Peter Steph Toy in about fifty minutes just looked white, empty, mm, and, mm. and and sort of the fear in the eyes, which is I, I I'm really struggling here. I, I don't know where where to find it type mm. thing. Do you think that can, without sort of teeing up to make excuses, but do you think that COVID thing is actually a much bigger part of their problem right now? Well, I, I mean, I'm going to take the fifth. Like, they won't. They won't. They won't admit it. it. So I'm not going to admit it. Okay. So it's not. It's 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 part of the prep. You know, it's got it's got to be. I mean, you know, are people running businesses at a lower profit because they they've got to you know yeah. put pay people who who not there doing the business? Yes, uh, these guys are professionals. They're out there. What I love about Rusty and the guys is is they won't be looking for excuses. They might have a go and tweak the ref influence or something yeah. like that, something that could affect it going forward, but they're not going to sit there and say, oh, but poor us about COVID. What they will do is I think they'll have a, they'll have a lower intensity training week. Yes. They'll, they'll use last weekend as the miles in the legs thing. Yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll keep the guys very well managed and monitored and, and then they'll have to assess, you know, because some of the players will dip off. Some of the players are going to go, you've seen it, yeah. peaks and troughs. You, you, you know, sometimes you go two games in a row where you're like, can I make it through the season? You get one rest into you and then you, you, you top of the pops again. We can't afford to do that for a, for next weekend. So it's, it's a big quandary. It's interesting. I was going to actually ask you about what you think the week would be like in camp. Cause I don't know. I'm, I don't know Razzie at all. And obviously 
you joke about the social media stuff and obviously, you know, I think as a competitive coach, you use all the tools at your means to get any kind of advantage. I kind of quite like it as well. Like I, I love the fact he runs on the water. I kind of want within rugby a technical area. Mm. And I think Warren yeah. Gatlin's, I love him. I think he's a bit jealous because I don't think he could run on more than twice without needing an <laughs> inhaler. Like I love Gats, but he's not known for uh, his engine do you know I mean, anymore. Um, so I, but I kind of like if you had two technical areas, yeah. I quite enjoy that. But I wondered in, in, in this camp, You've sort of said you go for a lighter week. Is he a screamer? Is he a shouter? Because there's a famous uh, speech from 97 where Ian McGeegan talks about the wounded springbok, you know, fighting mm, for its mm, life. Mm. Essentially, that's what you guys are mm. doing. You're backed into mm. a corner now. Yeah. What what happens? Like, t- talk us through it. Well, you know, will they be going fucking mad? Will they be going light? What are we going to expect to see this, this, uh, no, I th- this weekend? I, mean, I think it's a combination. So they will be going mad on Saturday, definitely. But whatever prepares them best to do that i don't know because the f- physically i'm sure they're going to they're going to have to assess these guys they are monitoring them they're going to have to see what kind of condition they're in um you know it's it's monday evening i th- i think they'll they'll will probably know that they're not flogging them on a on a monday and a no. tuesday but if if there are guys who need extra stuff they they will do it but i think they'll try and optimize their their prep for for saturday i mean I have you seen that Chasing the Sun documentary? I haven't, I've heard you must try and watch it if you can. It, it's it's actually a worthwhile. <clears throat> it's really a worth. I, I'm I'm a bit funny about those kind of things. I I, I haven't even watched um the one about the '95 World Cup uh, with have Matt you know, Damon. No, oh, don't watch that. Invictus. Oh, Invictus. Yeah, Invictus. Yeah, that's it's awful. Worth it. It's awful. Yeah, like, they, so I've never watched yeah, it. Yeah. All my mates are like, oh, you have to. No, I'm I'm like, the only thing that's funny about it is the bloke that plays Fitzy is a proper little sort of dumpling. You know, Fitzy is this great statesman of world rugby, and he's played by an absolute joke. My favorite is that there's actually all those memes going around where they're like, this is one of the greatest captains ever played for South Africa, and it's Matt Damon. It's like, no, that wasn't. Don't watch that because that's not that's that's a nonsense. But this is an inside documentary. Chasing the sun is is proper, and and they draw on a lot of the themes and. Rusty's quite big in that in terms of um, you can see that he's got a real finger on the pulse on what pushes the various players' buttons. So I think this is the key week. You know, if, if he's going to be a, a coach, you know, etched in stone somewhere, this is the week. And and everybody's got to be feeling that. He'll be pressing the buttons for the box. Do the do Two things. One, a lot of people are hyping up Warren G's halftime team talk. Must have been the greatest team talk in the history of team talks to come back from 12-3 down to win. Um, knowing him as you do, would, would it have been inspirational to Churchillian or would it have been a quiet cup of tea and don't panic? That's a very good question. I mean, obviously, do bear in mind, I never quite made it into the, the, the Lions test changing room. Um, so, obviously, I can imagine that after yeah, but that. You've played under him more I know, than most. I, I know. I mean, I played, yeah, I played for a year. I just, I just think in that kind of cold and intensity, you know, international coaches, for example, when we went into the change room in England, everybody now has got so many separate coaches. Sort of mm. for a minute, the whole idea is calm, have a, have a second. Get some hydration on, get the physio you need, relax, then you split into your players' groups, chat, and then you come back together. And I think that kind of formula sort of works the same thing with the Lions, where he'll then have the final word. And I think he would, I think, you know, it actually probably wasn't that difficult a team talk because, that, you know, what the Lions needed to do was do what, they were, what they'd set out to in training, just, you know, be more ruthless, be mm. clinical. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't create a mad move. It wasn't change the game plan. It was actually do what you're supposed to execute. It was like probably tackle lower. It was probably a bit smart on the discipline. It was, lads, we've had three fucking line outs. You know, we need to win that ball. We need to guarantee that that security. We've got to start playing. We haven't played, we haven't fired many shots, I would mm. say. You know, they've got into our 22 X amount of times, come away with points. We, you know, I think, well, what was the score at half time? 12-3. 12-3. We've won in there twice and we come away with one set of points. You know, talking about that and saying that the emotional energy you're literally playing for your playing for your lives here. So he does have that ability because he's got so much experience. And how many times has he been there where he's had to manufacture or create, and that's a, a kind of a unique win. You know, he did it. He's done it for Wales so many times against England. They lost every other game, and they come to us, and he, and he gets he raises the bar for for the Lions so many times. He's had that do or die test match, and he's been mm-hmm. able to get it together. And I I don't think it would have been rocket science. I think it would have played the emotional heartstrings, but certainly would have just said, "Listen, lads." Do what you're supposed to do. Fire the shots. Respect the ball. Get your discipline right. And actually, you know, when we get into their half, we have to make it pay. And the first thing they did is went to line out, went to Courtney Laws, who had I don't up to that point hadn't really thrown to. Mm. He wins it in front of it, which wasn't a great throw from Cowan Dickey. They do drive it over, and that's the first decent. I mean, they, against the weaker opposition, they drove some tries over, but I didn't think their, their mould looked that great on, no, on tour. No. I didn't think it was a real threat. I know no, the that, execution was brilliant, no. e- even from the kickoff. Yeah. yeah. So I was really peeved that South Africa went, you know, who's set up best? Oh, there's Murrow. He's got two, he's got two lifters. He's got a pocket of, a pot of guys around him. Let's put it on a, on a sixpence for him. 
Yeah. You know, if you're going to disrupt, you're 12 3 up, disrupt, go to the left, try and kick it out, put pressure on on one of the fullbacks or the wings or something like that. They went perfect execute, like something out of your captain's yeah. practice yes. training session, you know, big reach, lovely kick over. Ali Price, and, yeah. And Vili, Vili LaRue's going, is it mine? Quacker's going, is it mine? So the Lions just did three brilliant things yeah. in a row. For, for me, I, I love what you said there. They would have gone out to the pods. Whoever's handling kick receipt would have said, guys, when we've been kicked to you, Jesus, can you set up like this? Oh, we did that. That worked. Um, Ali, can you kick a little bit further because Philly's not actually can- – that worked. Yeah. And then when you're doing the line out, let's go to Courtney. Has a- that worked. And then yeah. suddenly the – I think they just suddenly stood up and said, hang on, everything the coach has said in there is working. Yeah. Um, let's just believe in ourselves. For me, that was the Yeah, the and I, I also think as well, Stuart Lancaster once did something that I thought was – was brilliant in terms of, he talks about, um, the, you know, international rugby or rugby in general about being a, a, a positive and negative chart. You know, for exactly what Bobby said is that, you know, uh, kick receipt, positive. Box kick, on the money, positive. Tackle at that uh, thing, positive. Penalty, kick to line out, throw. Po- you suddenly linked four positives. Yes. And I remember we played, um, we played New Zealand once and ordinary New Zealand, most part of the game, their, their, their positive chart goes up. England, a lot of times, two positives, too negative. And suddenly you see this chart. But when we beat them, it was like that. It was amazing. But as they yeah. tried to force it, they went down. We went completely up the other direction. Yeah, yeah. And that is exactly what um, kind of Lions rugby or, or any rugby is about now. And, and it ha- ha- the margins for error at that level have to be so right that you think, oh, just throwing, th- losing three balls at a line out. That's suddenly three compounded errors. Yeah. And if you looked at the chart, you suddenly go, we dropped the kickoff. Lost, you know, for South Africa, it would have been three negatives for us, three positive, and that is as simple as, in, as as rugby has to be. And that's why sometimes forcing it and keeping the composure and doing what needs to be done is actually a lot simpler. And I think people are looking for those Churchillian mm. speeches. They're looking for it, but honestly, the, you know, like we all think about any given Sunday, Al Pacino, it's a game of inches. You know, you see, you see Ian McGeekin talking about the stuff of the Lions. I guarantee Gats would have spoken. They would have got round. Alwyn Jones would have looked at the lads and gone, right, are we tired? First thing, looking at because mm. are we tired? No. Have we fired any shots? No. You know, do we fucking know what we're gonna do? Yes. Do you have faith in what we're doing? Yes. And that's and that's what would have happened. Yeah. And they would have gone out. There wouldn't have been, I doubt there would have been. I might be completely wrong, but there is never no, a moment. I, no, I think you're right. Yeah. I think you're 100 percent right. And it builds because it's it's a bit like it's the, the crocodile jaws, you know, yeah. in the business graph. It's like, you know, that's going down, that's yeah. going up. The more it happens, the wider it gets. Yeah. You know what I mean? And 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 they 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 would have said exactly that. Like, we've been doing quite a lot of things wrong and they're not running away with us. No. You know, we've missed two kicks as well. It could be 12 9. Yep. Um, you know, let's turn it. Whereas I think South Africa, well, here's, you know, we, we, we're all, it's all conjecture, but I think South Africa have gone, okay, that's working. Let's get in our, let's get in our yeah. bench now, super squad. You guys go in, <laughs> yeah. then you win, then we come off and we're all sweet. Yeah. And that just pisses me off because, because, you know, those were the two completely opposite ways they reacted to the first three minutes of the second half. Yeah. And do you know what the hardest thing with it is, with all those things, with the positive and negative, exactly as Bobby's saying, is when you're on the field, you know, if you make a mistake, your natural instinct is to go harder, is to work harder. Mm-hmm. And if something has been working the whole game, for example, like it was working for South Africa, and suddenly it's not going, the scrum's not going, you're like, well, we're just going to push harder. We're mm-hmm. just, we're just going to work harder. We're just going to run faster. And it's like, actually... No. And it's when the Lions, that second half, we talk about throwing the ball. You know, they, haven't, they hadn't had a lot of ball to play with at times. They hadn't put any phases together. So like, oh, well, we've been told that if we get a turnover here, we can play wide. Instead of someone going, hold on a minute, actually, let's just hold the ball and go into contact. And those kind of things, when you're under pressure, makes the mind do such bizarre things. And that's mm. why it's kind of so good in professional sport. Because everyone can see... Take a minute, calm mm, down, mm, mm. go harder. But as a player, like fuck, I've just made a mistake. Fuck, I'm going to run even faster. And then suddenly you get, you get caught. And I think it'll be interesting to see this weekend when it's a blank slate. You know, South Africa. Does South Africa become more South Africa? Mm. I think they've got. You know, mm, they, you know, mm. they kick smarter. Do they hold on to the ball? Are they physically ruthless? And the Lions. You know, do they go back to what they would? They did that one in the game, which is looking after the ball, which isn't forcing it. It's being probably quite direct and getting over the game line, and also being in motion. One of the things that, you know, being a bit of a nause for a minute, when South Africa, when they carry the ball, were in motion a lot of times, their forwards, mm. i.e. they were moving when they got the ball, getting over the gain line. In that first half, Lions were standing still. You see mm. people like Roy Sutherland, he's a great player or, or, or whoever it was, getting the ball, standing still, so nine passes to him, and then he runs, mm. he's getting killed. 
when we were already in motion, Ali Price or Conor Murray was hitting the guys, we were getting over the game line. That's why Courtney Laws looks so threatening because mm. he never stands still. Yeah. And I think that's going to be interesting. Do we, you know, hopefully they've spotted those bits of analysis. Mm. So when we come to this game uh, on the weekend, I think it's going to be unbelievably physical. And mm. I think, you know, there's going to be a few cards, I think, because people won't be able to keep a lid on it. Should we finish with the, do you want to do a prediction? Oh, goodness. <laughs> I'm, I'll, I'll go with a prediction because I, I believe that the rugby playing world needs a three-match series yeah. that means something all the way through. So I'll say South Africa, 25-17. Oh, interesting. And, and, and there's a lot of hope in that prediction, <laughs> but, but I, I genuinely I believe if, if they're good enough, that's how this game would have ended. The first game yes. would have ended closer to that, I think. Yep. I still believe the Lions might have come back and scored two tries, so you know, close to, to their, their three points at the beginning, plus 14, 17, and South Africa should have kicked on, scored a try, taken it to 19 points, plus maybe could two more should penalties. Have it could have, should have, would have, exactly. Yeah. So I'm, I'm hoping that's what it is. Shouldn't forget that they won the World Cup. Um, they're going to be better for the game time. Go on. Yeah, I, mean, look, I, I think, you know, they're, they're going to come back way better. I think they will have learned. I think they were blown off the cobwebs. And, you know, if you were going to, ever going to get them, Last week was the one to get him because this week I think you're going to see a different side, a different mentality come out. As the Lions will have got better, unless he doesn't t tweak too many things. But I, I had, I put ten seventeen to 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 the Lions, um, you know, because I just felt they could do that. But again, I, I, if you ask me to call it, did I see enough to have like supreme confidence? No. Do I think lots of guys put some great performance in? Yes. Do I do I love South Africa and the way they play? Are they the hardest team I've ever played against? Yes, and I imagine also the Lions will be some sore boys. Do you know what I mean? You know, when you looked at the amount of collisions, the amount of territory, the amount of gain line, you know, you have to keep dig you have to keep digging in. And I think again, they're gonna to have to look after players this week to to be refreshed mentally to go again. And and if it goes to a third game, that's even harder because you know, so you've got a winning massive, team, that's yeah. massive. That you know, you take so for example, after that game what they played Saturday. I mean, Monday in the evening now, they'd still be fucking in hell. I reckon most of them will be in more hell today. So how much can you do that? How much can you raise it? And I think it becomes about how good your squad is, mm. how good those the midweek veg or the team bin juice are going to raise the standards, drag those boys through. Um, so I think it's, look, it's all to play for. And I think Bobby's right. You know, it, it, without my Lions Town, it'd be great to win it and f seal it. But actually, who who doesn't love a fairy tale in the story? Mm. We, we've heard yours amazing mm. fairy tale today. I kind of think it'd be quite nice if it went to three games, all to play for, dying minutes, drop goal, Lions win. Fucking we're on it. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone loves the decider. Yeah. Um, Bob, it's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege. Thank you so much Thanks for so much for, having for bringing me. Bob's beef as well. <laughs> Phil we should look forward to that on the way home. Um, look after yourself in the meantime. We'll probably see each other sooner or later in the sky, but it's been look an absolute forward to it. Thanks, pleasure. Guys. Thank you, thank you. That is it for this week's The Good, The Bad and The Rugby in partnership with our good friends at City Index. We'll be back next week. Until then, enjoy the rugby this weekend on Sky. Here's Rob Brydon. <laughs>